I think for most people, in the way they learn German history at school or hear it talked about, 1945 is the end of the story. That was Neil McGregor talking about how people in Britain understand Germany's history. I think particularly we like to know human stories from humans who are like us. The, these are often um, ordinary people um, who, you know, have found themselves uh, through no sort of fault of their own uh, in absolutely extraordinary situations. And that was Giles Milton talking about the people who feature in his collection of extraordinary tales from the past. You're listening to the History Extra podcast from BBC History magazine. We're the UK's best-selling history magazine, available from all good news agents or via subscription. Check out our latest subscription deals at historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. The magazine is also now available on many digital devices, including the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Kindle Fire, Google Play, Kobo and Zinio. Look out for us in your app store or newsstand or find out more at historyextra.com forward slash digital. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. I'm Rob Attar, the editor of BBC History magazine. Our first interview this week is about the history of Germany. A very topical subject at the moment, of course, as the world marks both the centenary of the First World War and 25 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. A new exhibition at the British Museum, Germany, Memories of a Nation, explores the country's diverse history through a selection of objects, which are also being discussed in an ongoing BBC Radio 4 series. Our books editor, Matt Elton, met up with Neil McGregor, who's director of the British Museum and presenter of the series, to find out more. And what follows are some of the highlights from their conversation. You can read more from the interview in the November issue of BBC History magazine, which is on sale now. November 2014 is the 25th anniversary of the fall of the war. And that means that it's the 25th anniversary of the making of a new journey, of, of a new state, a new country. Okay. And that seemed a really good moment to think about you know, Germany now. Yes. Yeah. Um, obviously there's a great deal of thinking and discussing about Germany in the past, but this is a new Germany. Mm. And what we thought we would try to do was think that you know, in that moment, 25 years ago, when the wall comes down, and Germany, the two bits of Germany are put together, what you have is a Germany that's never existed before. Right. I mean, what's interesting is this, the first object in the exhibition is this, and it's a placard carried at demonstrations. Oh, wow, okay. For the unification. Right. And what is really interesting about this, it's carried in demonstrations in Berlin and Leipzig, mm. is that this map of Germany, which is what one we now know, had at that stage never existed. So it's completely new. Completely new, because yes, yeah. Germany before 1945, of course, goes on to the east. Yes, yes. Uh, for such a long way. Germany, after 45, is divided into two states. Yes. Whereas this is a new Germany. Okay. And we are in time for, we're one people. And the question was, you know, to this new Germany, what are the memories that all Germans bring? Right, I see. Because okay. what makes the country in large measure is, is memories, what does it know about itself from the past? Mm. Yes. And some of those things we can look at through things. So the point of the exhibition is to try to look at some of the things that embody the memories that all Germans have about Germany. I mean, that's obviously something we'll touch on in much more depth later. Yes. But we should point out at this point that uh, Germany's history has been very skewed in terms of how British people um, yes. Do you think this, this country is uniquely skewed in how it views Germans? Um, I think in European terms, yes. Okay. Um, because, I mean, obviously, the whole of Europe begins its view of German history with the years 33 to 45. I mean, with the, the Nazis, the Holocaust, the Second World War, and everything around that. Um, the 
countries nearer to Germany geographically have all been involved, whether it's France or Poland or Russia, in very conscious and public programs of reconciliation, of together looking at their history, together deciding how to move on. Britain and Germany have never engaged in that kind of dialogue. So for us, I think for most people in the way they learn German history at school or here it talked about, 1945 is the end of the story. Yes. For the rest of Europe, that chapter 3345 remains absolutely dominant, as it does for any German. Yes, okay. But they, there, is a, there, is a, there is a later story. Yes. So I think we, we, we have a different position, and that's why, we're, why I think we wanted to do this exhibition, because we haven't engaged with Germany after 1945 in the same way as the rest of Europe has. Because choosing the objects must have been a fairly daunting oh, task. Oh, very, very daunting. Very, very daunting. How, how long has that taken and how did you go about it? We've been it? working on it for, as it was, about three years. Okay. And the, it's, it's always that dialogue as you expect, between the issues you feel you want to address and the, whether you can find things that let you address them. We decided it's not chronologically organised, okay. but we decided that um, we, would, we wouldn't deal with ancient German history right. in any real sense. We would begin with really where the modern world begins and where Germany makes the beginning of the modern world with Gutenberg okay. and the first European printed book, okay. which is German, only happened in Germany. That's what we want to explore. Okay. And that is the moment where Germany makes the modern world. And you say that that could only have happened in Germany. Why is that the case? Well, so the object that is the Gutenberg Bible, um, British Library very generously lending it, or rather bringing it back. <laughs> 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 the point about that the, we'll be exploring I mean, the, in the exhibition you will see the first printed book in Europe, the book that changes all our lives even today. Mm. In the radio program, of course, what we can talk about is much more. I mean, how did this happen? And what's interesting, I think, is that Gutenberg is uh, a great entrepreneur, a great combiner of skills and techniques. And it's not that he invents anything in a sense. What he does is put together in a totally new way a whole series of yeah. techniques. How important was the idea of diversity in Germany's history and how does that come across in this, in this project? Most of us think, have been brought up to think of the fragmented state of Germany as a disadvantage, okay. as a political handicap. Mm. When it Germany you know, didn't get itself together till 1870, um, we, of course, did talk much earlier. <laughs> um, um, but in fact, of course, it's what I think the key idea about Germany is that it's always about creative fragmentation. Okay. Because if you think of the printing, you print in mice. And then, of course, the technique travels, the books travel, all that stuff. What you print in mice, the artificial mice, doesn't like to so be it. Right. So you sit across the river and go to another state. Okay. Yes. And they can't predict it. No. And that's why Luther is possible. Right, yes. Luther doesn't just need the printing press. And the Luther Bible is, of course, another of the great things in them. What Luther needs, as well as the printing press, is a fragmented political world where his books can't be suppressed and burnt. Okay, yeah. In England, they're all burnt. Yes. All of them. Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter whether Luther's books are found in Oxford or in Cambridge or in London, they're burnt in all three of them. Because you can't have printing press that the central authority doesn't like. No. So you couldn't really have had a reformation in England or in France. That's fascinating, yeah. yeah. Because the central power is strong enough to kill it. Yes. Or it would have been very different and much harder. Mm. It happens easily in Germany because of the political diversity. Right. And the Luther Bible, just to stay with the yeah, second yeah. book, which again 
from the British Library wonderfully lending us a copy given by Martin Luther to somebody with his own wow. inscription in it, Amazing. with his own handwriting of the Lord is my shepherd. Um, and that's a wonderful thing because the Luther, of course that is again another book that changed the world. But that because of the way German Gutenberg's invention worked and the business model, by the time of Luther's death, 500,000 copies in that library have been sold. That's huge. Yeah. And there's no other no. text in the history of the world up till then that's did anything like that dissemination. Yeah. Just yeah. not think of it. No. But the other thing it does is that that's what creates modern German. Yes. Because yes. as well as all the different political states, the German dialects are hugely various. So what Luther does, Luther has to translate the Bible into German. Okay. That's what he's doing. Yes, yes. As you know, this is the, the Bible in the language of the people. Yes. But which language? The people of Strasbourg can't understand the people of Hamburg. So what Luther does is construct this very deliberately intermediate generalized German that will be as widely understandable as possible. And that is what is, is what became German. So the act of him doing that creates, creates the language. The language. No. Yeah. And it's very German um, in the, the language in England or in France is created by the court in Paris, yeah. in London. It's the King James Bible. Yes. Published by the court. Yeah. It's Shakespeare who works for the court. Yes. That fixes English in Paris even more. The Luther Bible is done by the people, or they were the people, for the people. Yeah. It's a totally different construction of culture because you don't have the center. So it's these, so one of the, you've gone to one of the, the first section of the exhibition after the fall of the war, is this notion of a diverse yes. Germany, the variety of Germany. So we think, of course, of a German becoming King of Britain in 1714. If you're a Bavarian or a Saxon, you're not really interested in what's happened to the Electoral Hanover. It's such a different way of thinking about, about states. We, we, that's the point. Yeah. We, that's exactly the point. And the fact that, the fact that we, the, but was right, so that first section is the fact that we don't, you know, what is a country? Mm. We have a notion of a country, first of all, with only one source of power in it. Yeah. You know, so intensely centralized for a thousand years. Mm. That Germany can't even conceive that. No. It's only had it for 12 years. <laughs> That's because the only 12 years we know about. And one of the real distortions in our understanding of Germany is that, is that, that the, the notion of one centrally controlled Germany was a total historical aberration, yeah. which ended in catastrophe. Mm. Following the fall of the Holy Roman Empire, how explicit was the attempt to uh, create or search for a new identity? Very. Um, one of the things that happens in the wars um, across Europe, the resisting French aggression, is that every country that is threatened by the French, has to rethink what it is. You just need to think of Wordsworth. We must be free or die that speak the tongue that Shakespeare spoke. <laughs> yes. The faith and morals held that Milton held. Um, the, the response to Wordsworth, the response to language, the literature and the landscape becomes absolutely central to redefining what Britishness, Englishness is. Yeah. Exactly the same happens in Germany. You don't have a political structure. So, what are you? And you are two things. You are your language, and you are your landscape. Yeah. And the landscape means the German oak. Yeah. Because the German oak is old, it's ungainly, but it's strong. And it will withstand the tempest, and it will survive. Right, okay. And Caspar David Friedrich, Carus, 
you get this extraordinary flourishing of a landscape painting with the oak as the hero. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. Just like Constable yeah. in England, you invent a, sim- a symbol yeah. Yeah. of what your country is, and everybody can engage with the landscape and with the oak. Um, is there a single object that's a favourite of yours that yes. doesn't get the attention it otherwise would? Yes. After 1945, the, the borders of Europe are redrawn. From about 1250, Germans start settling across Eastern Europe. Uh, they're invited to Prague because Prague is Bohemia is depopulated after Mongol invasions. They're invited to Romania. They conquer the Balts and Königsberg. There are German communities right the way to the Volga. And most of them have been there for five, six hundred years. Okay. And all the big German, all the big Baltic ports, uh, Danzig, Riga, Tallinn, Reva, all of them are essentially German cities. Okay. So every one of those Germans of 1926 expelled. Okay. 14 million people are expelled from Eastern Europe as the boundaries move. It's as, and they all have to go to Germany. Right. It's as though the entire population of Australia and Canada had been forcibly repatriated to Britain in 1945. <laughs> yes. And if you think this, so how did you get there? If you're in Eastern, if you're in Poland, which is now Poland, you're fleeing from the Russian army if you can. If not, you're forcibly deported. There are no men. The men are either dead or imprisoned. So, and you probably, you're, you're leaving farms or whatever, where your family been for. And the women take the scars by the size of this table. And this is what a family from Pomerania, the entire family, mother, children and the old, mother pulling it, yeah. uh, sets off from Germany she's never visited, never been there. No. And somewhere between 12 and 14 million. It's the largest organised deportation of people in history. And the British know nothing about it. No. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. And it's partly because Britain was very taken up with what was going on between India and Pakistan right. and the terrible population movements there. Yeah. This is on a much bigger scale. Yeah. And all of them turn up in uh, Germany, which is effectively West Germany because they don't want to live under the Russians if they can, um, which doesn't want them. So when was this? Which? 1945, 46. Right. Yeah. yeah. Did these have a name? Is there a name? Just a hand cut. Just a hand, that's all they, yeah. But this object speaks for 12 million people coming to a Germany that they'd never been in. Yeah. And they turn up, of course, in places they get settled. They speak funny. Yes. They eat funny. Yeah. Yeah. And there's not enough to eat anyway. No. So what are they doing coming to eat other stuff? Yeah. I mean, this is astonishing. No. That was Neil McGregor. The exhibition, Germany, Memories of a Nation, is on now at the British Museum in London until the 25th of January next year. The accompanying BBC Radio 4 series continues each weekday at 9.45am, with a couple of late repeats each day, and previous episodes are also available to listen to on the BBC iPlayer. A book to accompany the series and exhibition will be published by Alan Lane in November. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also read more from Neil in the November issue of BBC History magazine, which is on sale now. Also in this month's magazine, you'll find articles on the Peasants' Revolt, Napoleon, the Battle of the Bulge and Agincourt. You can get hold of the magazine in all good news agents and digitally. And now is also a great time to take out a subscription. If you're in the UK, you'll get to choose a fantastic free history book when you subscribe, including new accounts of the Wars of the Roses, Thomas Cromwell and Waterloo. To take advantage of this deal, please visit historyextra.com forward slash subscribe, and it will be available for a limited time only. 
And now it's time for the latest history news with our website editor, Emma McFarnan. Tutankhamun is unlikely to have died in a chariot crash because his clubbed foot would have prevented him from riding in one in the first place, a new virtual autopsy has revealed. Analysis of a life-size image of the boy king, made from more than 2,000 CT scans of his mummified remains, suggests that Tutankhamun had a partially clubbed foot, buck teeth and a girlish figure. Because of his foot deformity, the king would probably have walked with a limp and used a cane, making it unlikely that he rode in chariots. Genetic analysis of Tutankhamun's family was also carried out and confirmed previous research suggesting that his parents were probably brother and sister. The findings will feature in a new BBC One documentary, Tutankhamun, The Truth Uncovered, due to air on Sunday the 26th of October at 9pm. In other news, fire broke out on the 19th century clipper ship Cutty Sark on Sunday morning, seven years after it was almost destroyed by a devastating blaze. According to London Fire Brigade, safety plans that have been put in place since the 2007 outbreak meant the fire was contained to a minor event that caused mainly smoke damage. The Cutty Sark, now docked in Greenwich, visited every major port in the world through the course of her working life. The ship left London on her maiden voyage on the 16th of February 1870, sailing around the Cape of Good Hope to Shanghai in three and a half months. A fire investigation team is currently at the Cutty Sark, trying to determine the cause of the fire. Meanwhile, a British soldier killed during the First World War has been reburied in a military cemetery after his remains were found in northern France. 36-year-old Private William Butterworth from 2nd Battalion, the York and Lancaster Regiment, died on the 18th of October 1914, when the regiment was caught in German machine gun fire during an offensive down the Lys Valley. His body was discovered in 2009 in a field near the Belgian-French border, alongside those of 15 other men. Private Butterworth was this week reburied in a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery in northern France. Thanks for that, Emma. Our second interview this week is with historical writer Giles Milton. Giles's latest book, When Hitler Took Cocaine, is a collection of what he calls fascinating footnotes from history, short accounts of extraordinary episodes and characters from around the world. Matt Elton caught up with him to find out more about the stories, and he started by asking Giles what inspired him to create the book. Well, I had started some two years ago, I'd started writing um, a history blog called Survive History, Surviving History. And it was really stories, um, stories of of extraordinary people who'd found themselves in extraordinary situations and how they survived these situations. And I started writing a weekly blog and it became, it it became quite popular. Um, So I continued doing it. And really this collection was born out of that because I'd always said to myself, if I ever got to a million hits on my blog, I'd publish it as a book. Um, I discussed it with my publishers and they said, well, we'd rather publish it as um, four Kindle singles um, followed by uh, a paperback with all the stories in them. So that's how it came about, really. Oh, that's lovely. And for people who might not know, what are Kindle singles? Kindle singles are short e-books. Um, I think the rule is they have to be under 25,000 words. So they're sort of thing that, you know, you see a, pe- a lot of people reading on the, on the tube on the way to work or on the train, on the bus. You know, things that they're often um, short stories, um, e- essays, collections like that. Easy to read, basically. Okay, fantastic. So how did you go about choosing what to include in these kind of selections? Well, you see, I write history books, and um, when I'm writing books, it's very frustrating because often you uncover just fantastic um, stories, incredibly colourful, flamboyant stories of adventurous and what have you, but they're not really relevant to the book you're writing. And so I had all these, if you like, offcuts from uh, from the various books I've written, and um, as I looked at them, I thought it's such a shame not to be able to do something with these. So this is what became my collection of fascinating footnotes from history. So the title of this collection is certainly intriguing. Could you tell us about the story that's related to that? Yes, well, I often like to write stories about people who you probably won't have heard about um, who were working for incredibly famous people because I think they shed a fascinating light on famous people. And the title story um, in this first collection is the story of Theodore Morel. Theodore Morel was the personal physician to Adolf Hitler, and he was 
really, he was a quack doctor, and he was pumping um, Hitler full of the most extraordinary cocktail of drugs. And for me, uh, this story, which I knew very little about, shed sort of an amazing light on Hitler and the, 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 the sedatives, the morphine, the cocaine, the barbiturates, the opiates, all of these drugs that were being um, pumped into him by Dr. Theodore Morell while Hitler was um, trying to run the war against the Soviet Union. That's incredible. Do we get a sense of the effect that they had on him? Absolutely, because Theodore Morell kept notebooks, daily notebooks of everything he was given, giving to the Fuhrer and um, exactly the reaction they caused. And this was quite remarkable. I mean, in the mornings, uh, Hitler was very, uh, very sleepy. He was very unable to work. So he used to pump him full of opiates and, and barbiturates. And these would immediately uh, revive Hitler. In fact, um, for some years, he was giving him amphetamines as well. So obviously these kicked, kicked Hitler into action in the morning. Um, Hitler was very worried about his virility when he spent the night with uh, Eva Braun. And so um, Theodore Morell gave him these weird um, testosterone tablets, which he used to take before jumping into bed with Eva. And the, um, the cocaine became something of a habit. It began as eye drops, which was not uncommon in 1930s Germany. Um, do doctors did prescribe this. But um, Hitler seemed to quite quickly cr uh, get an ad uh, addiction to the cocaine. And by the end, he was snorting cocaine. Um, quite in quite considerable quantities. As I say, all of this we know because these notebooks, very, very detailed notebooks, were kept by Theodore Morell. And in fact, um, interestingly, they only came to light some years ago. So this is all quite new stuff. Mm. So how did you come across them? I'd read about it in a number of books, and then I began to look into the archives and where the details were held and, and, and got the story out of that. Because I do like, as with my books, I like to tell the stories wherever possible from the original accounts, from journals, from diaries, from eyewitness accounts, because I think they, they always make things so much more interesting to read when you have the person there telling the story as it was. Mm, it's amazing. And how many years did this go on for in, in this case? This went on for years, I mean, six, seven years. And in fact, some of the senior members of the SS became extremely worried about the drugs that um, Theodore Morell was giving to Hitler. And at one point, they managed to steal one of these. He had these little golden packets of powder, and they managed to steal one of these packets and do scientific tests on it. And that they proved that um, Theodore Morell was, in fact, pumping the Fuhrer full of amphetamines. I mean, that's just one of the stories, though, in this collection. Are there any others that particularly stand out for you? Well, there's a whole variety. There's, 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 there are three about Hitler because that's the, he sort of forms the title uh, of the collection. Um, there are stories, there were war stories, there are stories um, about adventure and survival. I, I'm absolutely fascinated by uh, survival stories and why some people survive and one don't. So um, there's a, a great story about the baker on the Titanic who managed to survive the sinking of the ship by um, drinking two bottles of whiskey before he slipped into the sea. Now, normally, normally this would kill you because you're, it would cause you instant hypothermia. But for some reason, um, Charles Jochen managed to survive. So that's a wonderful and very colourful story of survival there. But one, one story that um, perhaps no one will have heard of because it's very unknown but um, for me it was a, an amazing double murder story from colonial India which is called um, in my book is called Till Death Us Do Part and this is a story um, of, a, of two couples who lived in Agra in colonial India in the Raj and um, one, the wife of one couple fell in love with the husband of the other and they decided to do away with, with each other's spouses um, and what made this double murder extraordinary is that they kept every single letter, um, every single thing they wrote down and sent to each other in the form of love letters um, and how much they arsenic they were administering into, into poor Edward's mulligatawny soup of an evening, um, how they were stirring it into his coffee, how many grams they were giving him. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. And um, they duly killed Edward Fulham, and then they duly bludgeoned to death Louisa Clark, um, leaving them as a couple, as a loving couple, they'd finally succeeded, except that the murders had aroused suspicion, the police became involved, and what happened is the police inspector came round to their house and found it, um, accidentally knocked his a shoe against a trunk in the bedroom and inside this trunk were all the love letters that Augusta Fulham had written to Henry Clark 
detailing exactly how they were going to do away with their respective partners. Uh, and also, what was particularly fascinating is it gave, gives these letters give a complete psychological makeup of Augusta Fulham's brain and uh, her criminal brain. So an absolutely fantastic um, murder story, double murder story from, from colonial India, which rocked um, the Raj at the time. It has caused an absolute sensa- sensation. Um, so that's one, one of my favourites anyway. That's incredible. Um, some of these stories sound quite big at the time they happened, but have been forgotten since. Why do you think that is? It's weird. I mean, so, it's some, they just do. There's some stories die. Some might be familiar to readers. I mean, one of the stories in the book is called The Long War of Hiro Onada. And Hiro Onada was, of course, the Japanese um, soldier who refused to surrender at the end of the Second World War. In fact, he died very recently um, at a very old age. Um, he carried on fighting in, in the jungle um, in the Philippines until March 1974. An absolutely extraordinary story of this um, Japanese soldier who would not surrender. He wouldn't surrender until his original commander told him to lay down his arms. So they had to find his original commander, fly him out to the jungles of, uh, uh, in the Philippines, meet with this soldier and tell him, actually, you know what, the war is actually over. Um, I mean, there's some debate about kind of big scale history and small scale stories. How do you think these stories kind of um, help us find out more about the periods in which they happened? Well, that's an interesting question because it, with all of my books, I've tended to focus on um, small individual personal stories, which nevertheless um, throw light on a much bigger uh, episode or chapter of history. That's what I think is interesting. Through, through the personal narratives, you know, you, you, uh, you open a window onto a bigger world. And some of these do that, some of them don't. But um, I think um, many of them are, are linked to big episodes in history. You know, I mentioned the sinking of the Titanic. The There's some big uh, war stories in there. Um, but some of them are simply individual stories because they're just, they're just of interest. I mean, there's a very interesting story about, which some people may, may, may or may not know, about Agatha Christie, who went missing one day um, in, uh, when she, she left her Berkshire home and simply disappeared for almost two weeks. Um, what had happened to her? There was a, a nationwide woman hunt um, for Agatha Christie. No one knew what had happened to her. And in fact, she was eventually found in a Harrogo- Harrogate home hotel um, under an assumed identity of Theresa Neal, which it transpired bizarrely was the name of her husband's mistress. Now, what was going on inside Agatha Christie's brain is uh, anyone's guess. But it's a fantastic story because, you know, she was extremely famous. She was already a household name. And it was a mystery, you know, worthy of one of her novels. And it was never solved. So, you know, some of the stories are are, are open-ended. Readers can make up their own mind about them. But they've been included because, frankly, I found them absolutely fascinating. Mm. Do we have any um, idea at all what happened to her? No, there was an inv- investigation into what might have happened. There's all sorts of theories that she might have had some sort of blank out. Uh, um, but no, really, uh, we don't know. All we do know is that, as I said, her husband was having an affair. She was extremely uh, unhappy about this and perhaps wanted to just sort of, uh, it was a reality check on him. In fact, he carried on the affair and she ended up divorcing him and getting remarried. Um, but it's one of those you know, odd stories where somebody so famous can just, can just go missing for 11 days, I think it was. Mm, Yeah. Um, So how does the process work in terms of you uh, finding these stories and then finding out a bit more about them? How, How does that process work? Well, I always look for, when I found a story, I, the first thing I want to know is, you know, are, are there any original records? Are there any diaries or journals? Because, as I said, that's what interests me. So uh, a lot of them are told, you know, are very much uh, told from the perspective of the person who's in the story. And one of them, I mean, one of them which is coming up in a future collection, in fact, is the story of the cabin boy on the Hindenburg, the airship that exploded into flames and killing many people on board. And that's the story of Werner Franz. He was a very young boy. He got a job on this airship. And by an absolute fluke, a a miracle, he actually managed to um, jump out of the burning airship and survive. And indeed, uh, I believe he's still alive. He's well into his 90s now, still living in Germany. But so with his story, not only do you have his account of what happened to him and the description of this ball of flame coming towards him. And as it came towards him, it burst the water tank that was above his head, drenching him and putting out the flames just around him. He jumped out of the airship. So we've got his wonderful uh, sort of colourful account 
of how he survived. And then um, interspersed with that, we've got the live ra radio reports um, which was taking place at the time because this was a rare occurrence for the for the Zeppelin to birth in America. So and, and the ex, the extraordinary account of the radio reporter on live on air um, describing the Hindenburg uh, docking at its docking station and then exploding into a fireball. It's one of the great live pieces of radio. So I was into, able to intersperse there two sort of eyewitness accounts. That's incredibly lucky being underneath that water tank. Yeah, <laughs> he, he was <laughs> extremely lucky, yeah. No, because many people suffered a rather more hideous fate on that day. Exactly, yes. How much does chance come into these stories? Well, that's a really interesting question with, with the survival stories. Um, chance, of course, comes into, into play in any... Um, story where people are thrown into extreme situations with perhaps no food, they're in sub-zero temperatures. You know, if you have a fur coat, it helps. If you have a gun, it helps. But what what's really strikes me is willpower counts for so much. And in this collection, there's a story called The Man Who Was Buried Alive. And this is a story of um, Augustine Courtold. Courtold was, um, he was an accountant in London, um, but very, very bored with his day job. When he was offered the chance of going to spend a winter on ice cap station in Greenland. Um, now, this was uh, an important mission. mission. It was to study um, air, uh, weather patterns over Greenland in the winter. This was important because international flights were just beginning. Now, he was wounded on the way to the station. Um, the weather took a turn for the worse, and his comrades decided they were heading back to base. They were not spending the, week uh, the, the, the winter in ice cap station. He decided he was going to, and he spent um, the better part of five months buried alive um, in the Greenland ice cap uh, with very little food, almost no fuel, and, but remarkable willpower. And he's a case where, um, you know, it's not easy to be alone under an ice, under an ice in an ice pack, um, cap, and yet he survived and um, kept a diary of his time there and um, records this wonderful moment where in the spring his comrades come back to dig him out. Um, so, you know, uh, that willpower in his case probably saved his life. Um, in the course of your research for all of these stories, what was the thing that most surprised you, I suppose? Um, I think often the bizarre nature of the stories. I mean, I do have a little uh, fondness for bizarre stories, but um, there's, there's one story of, um, if I could say his name right, Tsutomo uh, Yamaguchi. Um, now, Mr. Yamaguchi happened to be, um, have the misfortune to be in Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945 when, of course, the nuclear bomb was detonated. Um, uh, he managed to survive. He was pretty badly injured, but he managed to survive, um, witnessed the entire city destroyed, turned to rubble, witnessed all these hundreds of thousands of people being killed. Um, but he got out with bad burns, but he got out. He made his way straight back to his hometown of Nagasaki, arriving on the 9th of August, 1945, in time for the second nuclear warhead to, get to go off. And he was one of the very, very rare people who survived both nuclear um, explosions and became something of a celebrity um, and a campaigner against nuclear weapons in Japan. So his story is, is sort of one of the more bizarre ones um, in, in the collection. And a, a, another one from the Far East, but this time from China rather than Japan, is called The Last Eunuch of China. This is a story, a uh, remarkable story, of a man called uh, Sun Yaotung, who, in the, it, as a very young boy, in the autumn of 1911, he took the decision to be uh, castrated so he could become a eunuch in the imperial court. This duly happened, and the, his, his own vivid memory uh, of, of the pain that this uh, involved uh, is recorded, and I've, of course, put that into the story. Um, unfortunately for Sun Yao Tung, um, is that just as he had been castrated and was uh, made a eunuch in the court, the imperial court was dismantled, dismembered, and the whole of imperial uh, China fell apart. So um, he sort of ended up being a eunuch for absolutely nothing. Um, but so while it's sort of personal tragedy for him, it's it also opens a window on the the to the dying years of the uh, the splendor of the uh, imperial court in China, seen through the perspective of him and his fellow courtly eunuchs. Mm. So it's about finding these human entry points into these huge topics and periods of history, I suppose. 
I think it is because that's what interests me and frankly that's what interests most people. I mean we're we're all human we like to know human stories and and I think particularly we like to know human stories from humans who are like us. They the these are often um ordinary people um who you know have found themselves uh, through no sort of fault of their own uh in absolutely extraordinary situations and how how they survive these how they cope with these situations is is always remarkable um i have a story in in the second volume which is a story of um, a young german girl who was caught in the firestorm one of the RAF firestorms in the town of of Fotsheim in southern germany uh, again she she was um uh, she rushed into an air raid shelter uh and uh the air raid shelter collapsed she survived and she finally got out she was one of the very few people that survived from being in the epicenter of the firestorm uh uh that had been uh caused by the RAF at the time um her story you know which she recounted in full afterwards is just remarkable hmm. Um, And so in the course of doing the research for the blog and therefore these books, did you get any new insights into into history, I suppose, or human nature, if we can put it in those big terms? Well, I mean, uh, certainly stories about the the story about Hitler gave a a whole new perspective on. I had no idea that while Hitler was directing the Battle of Stalingrad, he was, you know, high as a kite on amphetamines and cocaine. Uh, That was interesting. I've got some... In the second volume, the, the second volume um, is called When Stalin Robbed a Bank. Um, and there are three stories. The first three stories are concerned Stalin, um, one of which some people may know that um, Stalin's great ban- bank robbery of 1907. But there's also, um, there are two very interesting stories, one about the death of Stalin and what really happened to Stalin. You know, was he killed on his deathbed um, or did he die a natural death? But the story that really um, is absolutely fascinating is the story of um, what's, what became known as the Red Frankenstein. This was a scientist, a uh, Soviet scientist called Ilya Ivanov. And he was, um, under Stalin's auspices, um, tried to breed a, a half-human, half-ape, a half-primate hybrid. Um, he started off by going to Guinea to try to do experiments there. And then he set up in, the, in southern Russia, he set up this bizarre um, human primate center where he tried to impregnate willing Soviet volunteers by inseminating them with monkey sperm and sperm from orangutans to try and um, conceive this bizarre creature. Um, needless to say, it didn't work. But there's a, there's, to that story, you see, there's an incredibly interesting postscript, which is the, the, this primate uh, center continued going for many years until there was a thaw in relations with the U.S. and U.S. scientists uh, came over to visit it. And this, in turn, gave birth to the um, U.S. primate center. So I think not many people in America would know that the, the, the famous U.S. primate center in America is actually born out of one of Stalin's most bizarre experiments to create a um, human-ape-like hybrid. That was Giles Milton. When Hitler Took Cocaine, Fascinating Footnotes from History is available now for the Kindle in both the UK and the US, published by John Murray. You can also read a selection of exclusive extracts from the book on our website, historyextra.com. And that's almost all for this week. Do join us again next week when we'll be talking to Jay Winter about the First World War and Claire Jackson will be filling us in on the dramatic events of the gunpowder plot. Thanks for listening to this History Extra podcast, which was produced by Jack Fletcher. Do let us know what you think about this episode by emailing podcast at historyextra.com and we might read out your messages in future episodes. Alternatively, why not keep in touch via Twitter or Facebook? where you'll find us at History Extra. For more great history content, don't forget to visit our website, historyextra.com, where you will find history quizzes, galleries, articles, and more. Plus, it's where you can download every single previous episode of this podcast. 